And so we need to think of solutions that um, work for everyone, regardless of class and regardless of ability to own property. Um, so I saw this really amazing talk this weekend at the Permaculture Convergence. This guy, Mark Lakeman, spoke about his work with City Repair, which is an organization in Portland, Oregon. Um, they do a number of things, including um, they get communities together to transition actual physical infrastructure in the city. So they take over an intersection and they'll like paint the street with the large mural like right on the pavement. Um, they'll turn the corners into things like a cob bench and like a solar powered self-servicing key station. Um, they'll get communities together to decide things like, oh, there's like too much fast traffic going on through our street. Like, let's put in a speed bump. Do we need to go to the city government and advocate for them to build a speed bump for us? No, like we can put in our own speed bump. We don't need to wait for permission on these things. So they take um, many, many, many direct actions throughout the city to do things like that. Um, they retroactively legalize things such as they will retrofit houses with cob um, and uh, straw bale insulation, which is illegal, and then have those things retroactively legalized through court rulings. Um, and um, they'll get people to connect their properties and plant gardens on them and all kinds of things like this and they're extremely extremely successful they've um, made a bunch of these intersections in portland into public space again kind of reclaim the commons that way um, they've gone to the point where city of portland the mayor has actually come out and said you know we're getting out of the way of facilitating this kind of change because there's a lot that we need to be doing as a government and there's a lot that we don't need to be doing and so they've like gotten out of the way of one of the first moves they made was identifying that there was no public square in Portland. The entire city, there wasn't a single public square where people could gather. And so they created a public square on top of a two-story um, a two-story garage, basically a parking garage. And the mayor said, no, you can't do that. Like, And they said, yes, like we're the people. We have the power and we're going to do this. Um, when they came out with their name as an organization, City Repair, the city similarly said, wait, wait, you guys can't do that. You're not the city. We're the city. And they said, actually, we are. We're the community. We're the city. And we're going to do this. Um, so we is also working on this project called Dignity Village in Portland, where they actually got the city of Portland to give an acre of land to about 60 homeless people who had no homes. Um, they began living in a tent city. Um, in little clusters of tents and circles and they started envisioning and designing their own village together and slowly implementing that so the first thing they did was actually build a meeting house in the center and then they slowly started building homes for each of the people there with natural materials and recycled and reclaimed repurposed materials turning each person's home one by one into from a tent into an actual physical structure um, and now it's like a village that actually stands no one's living in tents anymore there's 60 actual physical structures, they have gardens planted, they have all kinds of things like this, and it's still standing, and um, he wrote a book about it, um, about a variety of 10 cities throughout the United States. He's speaking in Oakland on Thursday from 7.30 to 10 at um, a place for sustainable living. Um, I'll get the address. But I really encourage people to go to that. That's the 18th. Um, it's my birthday, and actually if I have one birthday wish, I ask people to go to that talk because it blew my mind and the strategies that he points to, um, I think could really change this city. Um, What's his name again? His Mark Lakeman, and he's speaking at 1121 64th Street, Oakland, California, from 7.30 to 10 on October 18th. Um, so we had a house meeting today, and uh, we talked about a number of strategies for actually changing things. Yeah, it's 1121 64th Street. Yeah, from 7.30 to 10 on the 18th. Um, so we talked about a number of strategies for like creating serious change in this city, one of which, for people that want to live that way, that's a great way to start with um, 10 cities that evolve into villages through village building. For people that want to actually live in physical structures, to start encouraging people to squat and showing them that um, when we squat, we free up our time to actually organize for social justice all the time and that if they were to squat housing that they could then be organizing full time or like living out their passions whether that be art or whatever it be full time um, to start transitioning legal spaces by growing food in backyards and front yards and then to start gardening extra legally on uh, abandoned lots and things like this to facilitate neighborhoods to actually get together in neighborhood assemblies and start imagining if there were no blockades of capital and city 
regulations, um, what they would actually want their neighborhood to look like, and to start implementing that. Um, so these are just some like revolutionary strategies that we're starting to organize around. Um, so I wanted to invite people to that event on the 18th especially, and then just get in touch if you want to be part of this. So thank you. Yeah. You know, in all of this, I think is important. It's community building. Uh, it's it's being able. We did the same thing in the 60s. We wanted to change everything. We wanted to change our educational system. We wanted to change our relationships. We wanted to change absolutely everything. We did a lot of it, and a lot of it I consider um, community building, and it's it's really really very important. But again, I think the point of what I'm trying to say out of the South African struggle is you have to work on different levels too. This, so this ties in right with what she just said. Um, so where we're at in the tenderloin, San Francisco neighborhood that we've gotten into, is that we're going to have a tenderloin-wide meeting. And there's going to be a panel of occupied people that are going to interview the audience, about 200 people, to try to get the best and the brightest in the tenderloin to come down and quiz them about what are their issues and see what we can do to affect them. So already we've raised $138,000 for a nonprofit in the Tenderloin, and then over the next 10 years we're saving them another $1,180,000 um, total. It's $118,000 uh, every month, and um, we've fed thousands of people, uh, creating a company to give people jobs because they need that. So interview neighborhoods, find out what they need, have a neighborhood-wide meeting like we're about to have for the Tenderloin. And then go to the next neighborhood and do the same thing. Go through the whole city, making things better, making people's lives better by doing what we can do as a community. I do something as a, to do some of the community on many different levels, which is critical too. If you just protest, march, and demonstrate, that's not enough. You also got to do media. You got to do penetration to the neighborhoods and talk to people, find out what they want, so they can come on board with your goals and directions. So. I just want to add that because that's just pretty much what she said. So shortly, we're going to have the neighborhood tenderloin like meeting. Oh, Anybody wants to be part of that, like Ethan already offered, like already offered to do it. Anybody else wants to join, that'd be great. We're glad to have you. Thanks. Thank you very much. You were wonderful people. Thank you, thank you. And uh, so I'll thank you for a wonderful presentation. Mike, you want, Mike, you want to first speak? Uh, really well. So, uh, you think you want to speak? Yeah, I just, I just want to see if there are any more questions for Connie in particular. Um, there's a there's a section in in the shock doctrine by Nancy Klein about South Africa, and um, I know uh, you were saying this is. What happens afterwards is two different things. There's a separate from getting a, what's on paper a good a good moment or a good a good thing. I don't really understand what what actually happened when the break occurred, and also um, what what she describes is that um, if I understand it correctly, Mandela was thinking about maybe doing some nationalizations or um, doing more like a social democracy, and then according to Klein international markets freaked out and then uh, Mandela or maybe Tybo and Becky, I'm not really clear, uh, would make some noises about being more free market and then investment would, would be more favorable. Is this, I don't know what, how it's, it seems relevant in some way, but I hope uh, this will bring some buzz. That, that is what happened. Um, but in order to really explain it, you have to have a pretty big context, okay? That, that's when I meant that the ANC was made, meeting with heads of corporations starting in the mid-80s, and they went all the way through the 80s. I mean, really, the, the uh, you know, 1985 was the key year that, that, that everything really, which the foundation was laid for everything to change. You, you never see that if you're living through it. You can only, that's why history is important. But, they were, and what was happening, because they were also getting courted by the corporations, the corporations understood 
that this country was going to change. They understood that the ANC was going to be the one in power, and they understood they had wanted to deal with them. Now, <clears throat> inside the ANC, there were lots of different people with lots of different political persuasions. There were lots of communists inside the ANC. There were lots of socialists inside the ANC. Um, and so, a couple of things happened. Um, then, uh, the when the Berlin Wall fell, that's why I was was very significant. Look, the entire communist ideology kind of sunk with that. And, and this was an ideology that fed the movements of the entire last century. Every bit of it. I mean, we have, we have social security because of it. We have unemployment insurance because of it. This is where that all came from. All of the people who organized that in the 30s were either members of the Communist Party or the Socialist Party and very big in the No, I know, I know, I know, I know. I know. I'm not going back. I, I'm not going to tell everything, okay? I know there was IWW. I actually was a card carrying member once. Anyway, um, so to put this in a context, what I meant about what they were really geared for, okay, even though they were talking about lots of other things was to end apartheid and bring democracy in. It's like in the 60s, we were focused on ending a war in Vietnam. We were focused on bringing civil rights to African Americans. We were focused on building a women's movement. This is what we did, even though in our minds, we were focused much bigger than that. We wanted a revolution. We wanted society to completely change. We were thinking exactly the same way people are thinking today. It wasn't any different, really. But what we concrete did was the other. That's what we demonstrated about. And we were quite successful in all of those. So we felt that we failed. And we felt that we failed because we had much bigger things in our head. But we never had the organization to get there. So it, in the same sense that this was the immediate focus. Okay, and it's, it, it's very complicated. Obviously, the so that's why you have to look at the fall of the Berlin Wall along with the pressure of, of, of economic, you know, international finance, okay? And yes, it was Taboo Mbeki who did all of that. He was the one who was trained in, in economics and a bunch of other things. And as I mentioned before, they, um, they didn't want an economic collapse the way they saw happen in Mozambique and Angola. It was really devastating. And there were a lot of threats to that. And, and since then, they've made a lot of mistakes. Their black and pawn movement has been horrendous um, and, and allowed just for a few blacks to make a lot of money. And remember, all these were the people who were heads of the movement, who were the ones meeting with the corporations. They put the demands on the corporations that in order to work in South Africa, you have to have blacks on your board and you have to have yada, yada, yada. They did, and who, of course, get to be on the boards but the leaders of the movement like Cyril Ramposa, who is the leader of the mine workers. He's now one of the richest men in South Africa. Okay, and, and there was no, and they made huge, huge mistakes. You know, they could have done, when I was there, and I said, why didn't you do what the Cubans did? Why didn't you have brigades to go out, and doctors go out? And you could have had people from all over the world who would have volunteered. You had such goodwill. But they were mostly interested, to tell the truth, not no longer in the anti-apartheid movement, they were interested in the U.S. government. They were now a country, they were now head of a state, and they were interested in forming their alliances with other governments all over the world. That's a lot of what happened. Um, that's what I meant when I said they did not have a revolution at all. And now it's coming back to haunt them. There's big, big trouble there. And so hopefully this will change things, what's going on now. There's a tremendous amount going on in the country now. It's good. Now, Connie, I want to raise one post to ANC. I think you can read Because I worked in public health, ANC, and uh, in terms of the denialism of the South African Mandela, denying the actual risk of AIDS transmission, that too kills you. Oh, no. I mean, that was horrible when Becky did. That, to me, is the biggest blight. I can actually forgive him everything else because I understand his context. That I can't, even though 
I do understand where that came from, but it, it, that, yeah, it's been, it's been terrible. Since, since none of it was picked up here. Oh, Tabo and Becky basically said that um, he was, that AIDS, HIV infection did not cause AIDS, okay? And that this was something that's being perpetrated falsely on the African population and it's, it's, it comes from a perspective where during that time, intellectually, everyone learned how to distrust everything that came from the West. And for good reasons. It really comes out of that, even though it ended up in this horrible place. But that's where it came out of. And yes, it caused a lot of, a lot of deaths in South Africa. The other thing about South African AIDS, which I'm not sure everybody realizes, why it's so bad in South Africa was because of apartheid. Remember when in 1986, I think Uganda or one of these, there were big campaigns against AIDS all over Africa and big billboards and all kinds of things. Well, what was going on in South Africa? It was apartheid. Nobody was caring about any of the black people in South Africa. And you had people in homelands who were working, you know, away from their families and working in mines. And it was just, that's why it was so bad in that country. It's because of apartheid. Well, just to add to that, um, ironically, that whole meme about HIV not causing AIDS came from Daniel Duesberg in Berkeley and unfortunately was perpetuated by ACT UP San Francisco at in, in its declining phase and somehow wound up in South Africa being supported by the president. Very strange. And there's a great film about ACT UP called... Um, you must know it. It's called... Uh, United in Anger. No, no. Oh, God, what is the name of it? Exactly. It's called How to Survive a Plague. And it, it, it's really, really terrific. And the, this is also a really good film to see about movement building and mistakes that you can make, too, because they also had splits and... <laughs> and they did uh, they did a phenomenal job. I mean, they changed the entire medical establishment. It's astounding what they did. Really astounding. So, unless there's any more questions. I'm just wondering, um, in South Africa, what um, kind of what Ryan was talking about here in terms of building grassroots community and um, you know uh, communities coming together with their own resources and creating spaces um, what kind of thing was that going on in South Africa as well as the international pressure and no it, 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 <coughs> excuse me it was I don't know how to say this it, it was a different level of struggle it's it, it around different things I mean the majority of, of, of black South Africans are really poor. I mean, really poor. Poor like nobody here is or came from. Okay, it's totally, 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 totally different. And the, the notions of, um, look, what he was just talking about has all kinds of ideas in it. It has ideas about urban farming. It has de ideas about that part of a slow food movement. That has to do with do things locally. It also attacks our, our, our misuse of energy. There's all kinds of things going on inside the idea that he was talking about. And a community using its own resources, these communities don't have resources. They're really poor. So that's what that was. mentioned that one of the reasons why they succeeded as a movement is because they had strong leadership and you mentioned Oliver Campbell and I was wondering if you could tell us what qualities he had that made him extraordinary as a leader. Okay, <coughs> on, on different levels. Let me, let me tell you about how Oliver conducted his, his internal meetings. This is meetings like you would have, okay, where they're discussing things. He always listened to what everybody had to say. Absolutely. 
And he was so skilled, and they never countered people to say, oh, you're wrong. He, he never did that. He was able to talk about his ideas in a way together with someone so that eventually they would start articulating what he said as if it's their own idea. He just was very skilled. There, there was a, someone explained it. He came from a, a tribe in, in South Africa, the Pondo tribes. And this was part of the way that they did their community discourse. And he brought this into the way he functioned politically with his comrades, okay? So the other thing is he had an extraordinary, I guess, memory because he always remembered everybody. He remembered your son, what was going on with your son. <laughs> I don't know how he did that. Some people are really good at that. So he was, so you always felt your interaction with him was very personal. He was also an incredible diplomat. So when he functioned at the United Nations, when he functioned with reaching government officials, when he functioned on all those different levels, he was calm, cool, collected, and extraordinarily diplomatic and articulate. Um, and I think that those two things, um, you know, really helped in how he was such, you know, a good leader. And remember during that time, I mean, it's, it's um, you know, Nelson Mandela was head of the ANC when he was uh, arrested, and then uh, Oliver was like deputy head and then became head of it. Nelson Mandela, it's interesting, it shows you what, <coughs> what um, why did everybody know who he was when he walked out of jail? How did that happen? Well, the movement decided in 1978 to make that happen. They decided internationally you needed a face. This is, this is called doing good PR. So that face was going to be Tem uh, to, to be Mandela. That's what Tambo wanted. They and they got things done. They celebrated his birthday. The last birthday that they celebrated was at this huge concert in Wembley Stadium in 1988. But they they did it 10 years earlier in 1978. It was the first time that they did that. People went around and had university dorms named after them. They had streets named after them. This went on all over the world. There was even a scientific particle named for Mandela that the scientists had discovered. You know, I mean, it was everywhere. They made him into a household name. And that's why when he walked out of there, everybody knew who he was. And it's because before they did that, nobody knew who he was. So this is, so it shows you what you can do. great book written about Oliver Tambo. Um, there's the one that got written is not quite so good. So we'll have to wait till somebody does that some century. T A M B E. Yeah, okay. So it looks like we're going to be winding up Occupy Forum here. I did for a series called Have You Heard from Johannesburg? It, and I got the name for Gil Scott Heron's song about it and it it's seven uh, episodes it's eight and a half hours long and it covers basically the movement from the start of the united nations to when mandela was released in 1990 and we cover 12 countries so, have you heard from johannesburg you can find it on on the internet you can't see it on the internet yet but you can find out about it we've got a whole website about it and everything Okay, thank you very much. All righty, folks, we're going to let you go here. Um, I'm hoping Next that they're going to, I just won an Emmy for it, so I'm happy about that. Um, and uh, we also won the Audience Award on Independent Lens, and so Independent Lens is pushing really hard for PBS to re-show it in January, this January. So look out for it then. All right. So next Occupy Forum will be January, Monday. That was amazing. Um, on the 23rd, on it. here at Bradley um, Manning Plaza, come down here at 6 p.m. I wonder if you guys, let's take a temperature check, if people want to break into groups of about six.
So it would probably be like three groups of six. And we're going to head bust it up here, folks. Um, Thanks for watching, and uh, my next live stream will be on Saturday at 11 a.m. Really successful. Sullivan, and what made it successful. Signing off.